So I want to thank everyone for coming to One Shul. We're an online Jewish community. We have live streaming Shabbat services, classes, uh, holiday events, and more. Please let me know that you can see us okay, that we're coming through okay, that you can hear us, that the lighting is good, uh, that everyone has a pulse. Um, that kind of helps a little bit. Um, so please go ahead. Let us know that you can see us okay. I'm going to read over real quick some of the questions uh, that we have received, and we'll just kind of get things started. Feel free, by the way, to give your own answers to these questions, because just because I answered a certain way or Stephanie answers it a certain way doesn't mean that that's any more right than your answer might be. Um, you matter. Your opinion matters just as much. And as I said before, there are no questions that are off limits. You can ask anything that you want. So a few things that we discussed. Uh, what's the difference between halal and kosher? So halal is the Muslim version of kosher, or you might say that kosher is the Jewish version of halal. Uh, it's the same idea of a particular form of slaughter. Muslims say a prayer and they cut the esophagus. We say a prayer and cut the esophagus. It's very similar. There are some differences in terms of what animals Muslims will eat that we won't eat, um, and Muslims can mix meat and milk. Uh, we were asked some really difficult theology questions like, uh, prove to me that God doesn't hate. That was a pretty intense one. Mm. Uh, people were asking questions about the Talmud. Um, we had questions about uh, Israel and the state of um, reform converts in, and conservative converts in Israel. Uh, can you become a Jewish citizen of Israel uh, if you had a progressive conversion? The answer is only if you're married to a halakhic Jew right now. Doesn't mean that the law won't change. Right. Right. Laws change all the time. Uh, the Noahide laws, why do you hear about this in orthodoxy but not in progressive Judaism? The answer is, and I honestly didn't have a good one. Do you have a good answer on that one? I don't, actually. Yeah. I, I mean, I wonder if it has something to do with it being harder to convert within an Orthodox community, you know? Possibly. And taking longer. Okay. So it's, you know, maybe a way to be the part of the community without quite taking the last step. Okay. Fair enough. Uh, but I don't know. That's just, <laughs> you know, I have no idea, honestly. <laughs> so, yeah. So those are the uh, the questions that we, we have had so far. Uh, we have a few more, and we're going to actually answer those a little more in depth, but those were the questions that we were asked at 3 o'clock. Uh, we have a question in the room. Can I ask a question anonymously? Um, you can, but it's a little bit tricky. I would make this comment that we are all friends here. Mm -hmm. We are a community here. We all care about each other. And there's no such thing as an inappropriate question or a stupid question or too personal a question. Because um, we're about to talk about circumcision. <laughs> and okay. guess what? I have one. <laughs> so, you know, if I'm willing to say that on um, the YouTubes, um, then I think we can probably have a pretty open uh, conversation here. So, yes, if you want to email me a question uh, via email, that would be great. Um, but really, I would encourage everyone to post questions here because then we'll actually be able to answer them and we can answer them right now. And that's half the fun. We all get to know each other that way. And I have Judaism questions that I'm going to ask Stephanie because oh, I no. would love, I would love to know, um, I would love to know her thoughts. So let's start with, we're already getting some questions here in the chat room. So let's go on ahead and answer some of those. Our cat is beating at the door. And the cat is beating at the door. The cat was, was uh, wheezing when uh, we were doing class earlier. Oh, no. And then the people with the fire extinguisher showed up. So it was a very eventful class. <laughs> okay, so the first question comes from Well Widget in the chat room. Okay, this might be tough. Sorry in advance. Awesome. The 17th anniversary of my mother's death is this week. Very sorry to hear about that. May her memory be a blessing. She was an agnostic, and I'm still a non-Jew on my journey to conversion. I have no idea how far along that path I am, really. Would it be wrong for me to observe Yarsite or some form of Yarsite for her? Would it be breaking halacha to stumble my way through Mourner's Kaddish? And did I miss my chance because... Uh, 
did I miss my chance because by the Hebrew calendar, it would have been the 11th, not the 15th, the civil one. Okay. Um, so, I'll, I'll answer the halakhic question, and you can answer the emotional question. Okay. All right. The halakhic answer. It does, when a non-Jew violates halacha, it's not violating halacha. Okay, so like as an example, I go out to lunch with my parents who aren't Jews, um, although I joke that my mom's a big Jewish mother. Um, um, and, and this is her calling herself that, by the way. It's a, it's a joke in our family. Um, so I go out with my parents. We go out to eat sushi. Mm -hmm. My dad has pork, uh, or I mean um, shrimp, like shrimp sushi mm -hmm. or, or pad thai or something like that. He has not violated halakha. Because Jewish law applies to Jews. It doesn't apply to non-Jews. So if you're not Jewish, it's not a sin to eat bacon. It's not a sin to um, uh, not observe Shabbat. Uh, because those laws don't apply to you. You haven't taken them on. One way of looking at it is, imagine you're a citizen of, um, uh, I don't know, any country. Imagine you're a citizen of Australia and you come to the United States and uh, it's time to vote for the president. You haven't broken U.S. law by not voting for president because you're not an American citizen. You don't have to, right? Okay, same exact idea. So if you're concerned about halakha, you don't have to be if you don't consider yourself technically part of the Jewish community. So don't worry about it. And from there, you should absolutely observe the yard site and say mourner's Kaddish if that's what's going to help you in your journey. It doesn't, it doesn't matter. I mean, it's, you need to do what you need to do to help you with your mourning and with, you know, your, your spiritual journey, which, wherever that takes you. And if observing the yard site and saying Kaddish does that, then you should do it. And, I mean, since Halakha doesn't, you know, apply, I don't even think the date matters. I'm not sure if it matters... One way or the other. No, it doesn't. Yeah. It doesn't. Because, I, because, I mean, unless you are trying to practice, unless you're trying to practice Orthodox Judaism as a non-Jew, then you really don't have any conflict mm -hmm. there at all. I mean, you really don't. Um, you know, you know, you can celebrate any Jewish holiday you want. You can make challah. You can learn Hebrew. You can do anything that you want. If you don't consider yourself a Jew and you're not quite there yet, because like you said, you have no idea how far along you really are at this point. I don't know if that's because of how you feel or if that's because rabbis have told you something or Jews have told you something. I'm going to give the benefit of the doubt and just say that everyone's been cool to you. Um, if you don't feel like you're there yet, then, you know, really Judaism at this point is kind of like a test run at this point. And, mm -hmm. you know, you should do what you feel is right yeah. for and, yourself. Yeah, and I mean, and for example, I mean, my grandfather passed away um, a few years ago around Thanksgiving. And so his yard site will fall like that weekend after Thanksgiving or before or somewhere in that weird area. And so... I will sometimes say Kaddish for him several times over several Shabbats leading up to it. You know, just whatever whatever I feel like is the right thing to do is what I do. And, right. And that's worked. So So there you go. Um, you know, one of the things about halacha, because this is something that trips people up, you can't look at halacha as being moral issues. So, like... You know, if I say Mourner's Cottage for a yard site on the wrong date, that I have somehow offended God, or that I have done something that is morally incorrect, I think a way of looking at halacha that's more realistic and a little bit truer to the vision of what Jewish law is, think of it like a language on a computer. Um, so computers operate on a language. It's the code that writes the program. And so it's kind of like in the old days, you couldn't run Windows software on a Macintosh, or you couldn't run Macintosh software on a PC. It's the same kind of idea. It's not about a moral issue. Um, you know, as an example, a Chabad rabbi was once 
told by a member of his congregation that um, he had eaten bacon and he was worried he was going to go to hell for eating bacon. And the Chabad rabbi said, well, Jews don't believe in hell. And if we did, do you really think God would send you to hell for eating bacon? Having said that, you shouldn't have eaten bacon. Mm -hmm. Okay, and that's kind of how you have to look at halacha, is that it's the rules for the program of Judaism. It's the language of the Jewish soul. And that that's different from the sort of right, wrong, is God going to be... I mean, literally, people will email us and say, will God be mad at me if I flip a light switch on Shabbat? You know, like, and you kind of... That's a way that people sort of torture themselves, and it's it's really something you shouldn't do. And isn't the literal translation of halacha something like the way or the right. path? And mm -hmm. so, I mean, and it's just that. It's a path, but we all deviate off the path sometimes or take the scenic route. So, you know. And using that sort of path metaphor, if you imagine walking past a fence. Okay, so halacha makes a fence. It makes a path so that you're not just wandering around in empty space. Some people just see the fence. And the fence is the don't go there. And that's all they see. They don't see the fact that if you just turn around a little bit, it's not a fence telling you not to go this way. It's actually a path showing you how you can go that way. And that's, you know, that's really, I think, what it's about. Um, Cajun makes a really great point. I would think that it's never wrong to do anything that your soul is guiding you to do. Uh, so, yeah. Um, let's answer a question that was emailed to us earlier. Actually, this isn't, this wasn't email, this was YouTube. One of the most popular YouTube videos we have is a YouTube video where I talked about circumcision. Oh, oh. <laughs> oh my goodness, that was a popular video, and I get all kinds of emails about that. So, this person asked two questions. This is from... Uh, Mitcon1, so YouTube names are kind of interesting, and the person asked, do you have Brit Mila? So I presume the question is, uh, am I circumcised? Um, do you think that like other like rabbinical students have to deal with stuff like this? No, I no, don't. I don't. I, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> um, so anyway, so... I'm going to step back from that a little bit, um, but I'm going to talk about a circumcision because it's actually a big deal. Um, w how long ago was it that they tried to ban it in San Francisco? Oh, that was like in this past year. Yeah, so it was mm -hmm. in this past year. And there's other places too that I think have, you know, contemplated the idea of banning it. Right. And so, you know, this is a very volatile issue. There's support groups actually in the United States and in Israel for Jews who don't circumcise mm -hmm. their sons. Right. Um, and I've gotten in arguments. Right. That's true. I, I, I almost got in a fist fight in yoga teacher training of all places <laughs> over circumcision. So, um. so, you know, so, so this is a volatile thing. So I'm going to tell you straight up how this, what this is all about. The, uh, how many, I think I've been to, two, okay, I've been, I'll say that I've been to one uh, Brit Mila ceremony. I've actually been to two, but I've only really been to one where I was there for the whole thing. And this was the son of a rabbi that we know. Oh yeah, we went together. We went together. Yeah. Okay, mm -hmm. now, what surprised me going to this, and we were fairly close to the baby. We weren't hovering over or anything like that, but we were like a table away, I we guess. We were pretty close. We, yeah. were, we were pretty close. Was how baby Naftali basically made no noise. Yeah. And I was very surprised. And, you know, leading up to it, uh, his mama was giving him, like, what was it, sugar water or Manischewitz or something? I think something. they had Manischewitz. And so yeah. what they do is they, they take a little... Um, old cloth and you just kind of chew gums i guess on it you mm -hmm. chew you don't have any teeth yet mm -hmm. um and uh or sometimes the parents will give sugar water um they put a numbing medication um you know on the baby's genitals and the actual circumcision literally is like that mm -hmm. and he, i think honestly more of the anxiety and stress was before 
before they actually performed the ceremony Mm -hmm. because he just didn't want to get messed with. Like, babies don't like being messed around with by by someone who isn't their mom. Yeah, and he's a few days old, like, you know. Right. He doesn't even want to be out of, like, the crib in his, you know, little PJs. Right, exactly, exactly. Let alone, like, the superstar of the synagogue, you know. Right, right. So. And so, so it really surprised me because I kind of, on a certain level, was... I don't want to say that. I was hoping it'd be more dramatic than that. It was anticlimactic, I suppose. Yeah. You know, and so I, it kind of really changed my perspective on circumcision because I was already at a point where I was like, okay, the anti-circumcision propaganda, I don't really buy into it um, as much. But I wanted that experience to know for sure that that's how I felt. And it really did confirm, mm-hmm. kind of. I oh, was absolutely. I was already about 75% of the way yeah, there. You know, and I mean, in a, you know, I think almost everywhere now, most of the time your moil will be a doctor. Right. You know, and that was the case here. The moil was a doctor. Unless you're dealing with ultra-Orthodox mm-hmm. or ultra-Hasidic communities, the moil is a urologist. Mm-hmm. Right. You know, because that's the only person who can do it. Mm-hmm. Um, having said that, um, some of, uh, I would think if I was a parent and someone came to me and said, you know, would you, are you going to, what should I do? I would say that the circumcision is not that big a deal. Um, but here's what I would say, which runs contradictory to what a lot of people would think. I would not have it done in a hospital. I would not have it done in a hospital. I'd have it done by a urologist, a moil, um, in keeping with the traditional Jewish practice of having it be a community Mm -hmm. tribal event. I think on a practical level, it's perhaps, you know, there's less room for error, Mm -hmm. you know, in a community event. Because you, that's where you hear all these horror stories about circumcision is when they happen in the hospital you don't see it happen. Right. You know, it's just, oh, here's your baby. We're yeah, you're not system. you're not there. You, know? you don't get any say over anything. You don't get to decide who's touching your baby even. Mm-hmm. Right. Right? I mean, it's just, you know, the baby's taken out of the maternity room, and then all of a sudden, your baby's back. And, um, you know, you wouldn't do that with a pediatrician. You no. wouldn't take You wouldn't take your baby to a pediatrician and just kind of drop the baby off and then come back 30 minutes later. You know, and yet that's pro forma in a hospital. That's mm-hmm. just normal. And so, yeah, that's that's where I stand on it. Yeah. 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 I'm, I'm at the same place. You're at the that. same place. Yeah. <laughs> okay. It's a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good thing. Okay, so Ari has a question. I want to discuss something. You said before that it's impossible to make Aliyah after progressive conversion. I'm pretty sure that is not true. Israeli law of return accepts now reform and conservative conversions. Okay, so here's how this works. If you are a person... Okay, so okay, I'll say this first. Israeli law changes all the time, right? So it used to be impossible to go. Then it became really easy, and now it becomes it's it's more difficult. The law may have changed recently that I'm not aware of, um, but I would say this: what what law of return is about is about having a passport that has a Star of David stamped in it. That's all it's actually about. Right now, I don't want to do this, by the way. You and I could could go to Israel and be Israeli citizens. Right. Right? The question would be, are you a Jewish Israeli citizen? Mm -hmm. And that's what it's really about. Um, So you you can go. So you can go. You just, depending on where the law is at that day, may not be a Jewish Israeli citizen. Right. Um, So... Uh, that's really what it's about. I, I'm nervous for the sake of the fact that, you know, when we when we do these classes, these are then archived on our website and on YouTube. So this is being said in November 2012. I don't know what December 2013 mm-hmm. is going yeah. to look like. And you I know? mean, just, you know, honestly, if it's something that you are very interested in, email your Israeli consulate. You know, and find out what the deal is. Right. I, I right. mean, honestly, that's you, the that's the only way to know for right. sure. Um, nefesh benefesh is 
the, the ideal website. I mean, I know, um, I know a guy. Okay, so like as an example, I know a guy who wanted to make Aaliyah. He, uh, his mother uh, is halakhically Jewish. His grandmother is halakhically Jewish. He submits his nefesh benefesh paper. Finds out that his great, I want to say his great grandmother converted uh, conservative, and therefore could not come, could not be, in, could not uh, apply under nefesh benefesh mm -hmm. uh, their Aliyah program. So, you know, it's it's really a. a a tricky thing. Mm -hmm. um, again, that gets into politics. Not really something I could talk about, but, um, you know, I yeah. think what Stephanie said is absolutely true, which is just check the law. And, um, you know, I know people don't want to hear this, but if you desperately want to move to Israel and you have to have the Orthodox conversion, then get one. Mm -hmm. You know, then get one. You know, it doesn't change what kind of Jew you are. It doesn't change how you feel. Um, you know, it's a, it's a stamp on that passport. How badly do you want that stamp on your passport? Mm -hmm. So, so I would say about that. Uh, Tamara, it looks like Tamara was about to, um, uh, ask a question, but it got cut off. So you might want to, uh, ask that question again because it, it didn't come through. Uh, how do Jewish people feel about, and then... Uh, it looks like it got cut off. So you might want to ask that question again. Um, okay. Here's a question. Um, it's actually the question that this person asked is not the question that I want to answer. I want to talk about this topic because of the guy's name. So this is a follower on YouTube. and He's got the best name ever. Messianic Muchacho. Nice. Well. <laughs> Messianic Muchacho. Okay. So, um, so the, the bigger question, because we get asked this all the time, is what do you think about Messianic Jews? Um, now, what I think doesn't matter. That's kind of irrelevant. Uh, Punctura is open to everybody. So anyone who wants to show up can and participate. Um, you know, so that's not really the question. What was really happening is anytime we post something about Messianic Jews, there's just a firestorm of conversation. It's like such a controversial topic that people just, if, if we have ways of tracking what articles and, and videos are more popular, and these Messianic Jewish, whenever we discuss you know, Jews and Jesus and all of that. It's just huge. I mean, it's just tons and tons of hits. Um, I will give you my perspective. It is my perspective alone. Um, there are probably people who agree with me. There's probably, there's definitely people that disagree with me. If you are a person who believes that Jesus or anybody else, you could believe that your neighbor, Kevin, is the Messiah. You are no longer practicing Judaism because Judaism does not hold to the belief that the Messiah has come. Now, you can you can have a Seder every year. You can eat latkes. You can whatever. If you believe that Jesus is the Messiah, you have stopped practicing Judaism. You are practicing what I would call Hebrew Christianity. Um, and that's okay. Plenty of great Christians in the world. Plenty of great Christians who are interested in Hebrew, who are interested in learning about Judaism. Uh, there are plenty of Jews who convert to Christianity, but still like to do Jewish stuff. You are practicing Christianity. Own up to it and be comfortable with it. If you're not comfortable with it, if you're like, no, I'm, I'm Jewish and it's that simple, and that's all there is to it, but I'm, you know, messianic, um, I would say you're not really owning up to what you believe. You're not really taking hold to the fact that you believe that Jesus is the Messiah, um, and that that puts you into a different faith tradition um, than the one that uh, is sort of normative Jewish practice. And I'm taking, I'm, I'm taking a very big tent approach to what normative Judaism is. Um, 
If you're a Jew who, you know, believes that Jesus is the Messiah, you are practicing Christianity. Now, in terms of does are you still Jewish, whatever the case is, according to Jewish law, nothing can stop you from being a Jew. Once a Jew, always a Jew. But you are a Jew who practices Christianity. You don't practice Messianic Judaism. You don't practice, uh, you know, the true faith of the Jews. It, you practice Christianity. And that's your choice. Thoughts? Nope, I don't know. <laughs> I get very worried about this. Like, this is a, a, a big, hot thing to me because, a uh, hot topic to me, because I get very frustrated about people who talk about Judeo-Christian values. Yes. Does that frustrate you as much as it, it frustrates me? It does. Me? It okay. does frustrate Would you like to share? <laughs> I'd like to share. Well, I think that, I personally don't think that we can lump the two faith traditions together. You know, I understand that Christianity came out of Judaism, you know, and that Islam came out of Judaism. However, they are three separate faith traditions and that over the, you know, length of history have developed differently, you know, and each one has some very different values, quite frankly. You know, we all share some values, but there are some that are very different. And so this whole idea of Judeo-Christian values, most of the things that I find, you know, people labeling as Judeo-Christian values, I might argue whether it is really a Judeo value. You know, I would say it's a Christian value, and that's okay. <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it, I, I had a great thing happen to me last few Sundays ago. I got a phone call from a friend of mine who said, would you like to be in a photo scavenger hunt? And I said, I don't even know what a photo scavenger hunt is. And she said, well, I have a friend who needs a photo uh, for this scavenger hunt. I guess he takes weird photos uh, as part of the scavenger hunt, and if he takes all the photos, he wins a prize or bragging rights. So the question was, or, or so the, uh, the question she had for me was, would you be a model in a photo that he needs? And I said, okay, well, what's the photo? She said, I need, he needs a photo of a rabbi, a priest, and a minister walking into a bar. And so I said, absolutely, I would love to be in that. So I show up to the bar that we're meeting at, and uh, sure enough, uh, it was me, a Universal Life Church minister, and um, a Lutheran priest, a Lutheran pastor, wearing his clerical clothing. And so the Universal Life Church pastor sort of does like weddings, more of an officiant um, than a, a minister in a pastoral sense. Um, so me and the uh, Lutheran pastor ended up like really broing down and having a really good time. And like we talked about like seminary school. He talked about what it's like to be a um, a pastor in like. Gainesville, Georgia, which is north, sort of north Georgia. Uh, we talked about theology. We talked about history. Um, I'm like one of three Jews in the world who's actually really interested in Martin Luther, who was like a horrible anti-Semite at one point in his life, but I think he's an interesting historical character. Um, so like I asked him questions, he asked me questions, and at the end of the deal, he said, hey man, would you ever be willing to do like a show us or teach us about the Passover Seder? And I said, absolutely, bring it on. I said, just pay the cost of the gas for me to get up there, and I would be more than happy to do a speaking engagement, okay? He's not trying to make me a Christian, a Lutheran. I'm not trying to make him a Jew. When I go and talk to his congregation about what Passover is, I'm not going to validate their Christianity for them. That's not my job. My job is to talk about Judaism. Okay? And we can enjoy each other and enjoy the experience of learning about each other's faiths and just be friends. And that can be it. And it doesn't have to be any more complicated than that. And, uh, you know, at the end of the evening, what I really gathered from hanging out with my new Lutheran priest friend was that we have similar gigs. Like, we try to help people out. We use our faith traditions to help people better themselves. Um, and, you know, at the end of the day, it's kind of the same, uh, you know, it's the same job. You know, just different departments <laughs> in the same company, so to speak. Um, uh, 
but you know, there's there's no doubt that he's a Christian. There's no doubt that you know I'm a Jew, and we can like each other because we're different, and we can have fun with that. I like you because we're different. <laughs> so there you go, right? So anyway, um, so that's that. Um, let's get some more questions. Are there more questions that people have been asking? Mm -hmm. I know Tamara was maybe, looks like, having some technical difficulties or something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, what do Jews believe about S? So S could be, uh, you know, sandwiches. How do Jews feel about sandwiches? I think Jews love sandwiches. We love them. Very pro-sandwich religion. Well, I did think of the one Christian Judeo value that I think no one will argue. Okay. I mean, I, it's probably an, an Islamic value as well, although okay. I can't swear to that. Potlucks. Absolutely. Potlucks. All religions like potlucks. It's true. There is no religion in the world that doesn't <laughs> appreciate a good potluck. Um, do Buddhists have potlucks? Yes, I think they do. Oh, really? Yep. Do you have some way to confirm this for me? Well, there is like a um, there's a Thai Buddhist temple in um, Berkeley that has oh, okay. like a brunch. It's not really potluck though, but uh, it probably feels like one. Okay, so all religions like potlucks. We'll just go with they. Do. Okay, great. So that's the ultimate ecumenical uh, sort of statement. All religions like potlucks or group meals. Yeah, some some form some of some form. Yeah. Uh, so, well, widget says my Buddhist friend in Cali has had potlucks at her temple. Proof. 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 There we go. <laughs> the one uh, the one thing that all religions have in common: potlucks. Uh, okay. Mary Ruth Andrews asks, "Are you a rabbi, Patrick?" Not yet, but I'm working on it. Uh, I was the closest thing to a rabbi for the sake of photography, so <laughs> that's how I got that job. Um, I'm going to Rabbinical Seminary International, which is a distance learning program. Uh, I will be done sometime in June or July, God willing. And, um, yeah, that's what that's all about. And it's been an exciting journey. I'm happy to answer questions about that because I get a lot of those kinds of questions. Um, I don't know. What do you think about me becoming a rabbi? Has it been a fun experience for you so far? I don't think I've gotten the brunt of the experience. <laughs> Fair enough. You're becoming like a rabbi and a rabbitson altogether. That's like, true. I have so. been doing a lot of the rabbitson stuff yeah, lately. Yeah, yeah. We have services at our place and he usually cooks. <laughs> it's true. Uh, do you keep kosher? Would you like to answer that question for us? We do. Okay. I, I mean, the answer is yes. <laughs> so we keep a vegetarian house, actually, and so that's that's how we do it. So we don't have, like, you know, two of things. We just have one of everything because we don't have meat in the house. So The only time meat is ever in the house is when I either get Chinese food or a deli sandwich from the kosher Kroger that's mm -hmm. uh, around the corner from mm -hmm. the apartment. And that's on paper plates or whatever the to-go mm -hmm. sort of yeah. thing is. Yeah, it's, you know, it's, it's economical and it's, con you know, easier, so. Yeah, it's convenient. Matter of fact, uh, an acquaintance of ours just recently uh, switched from an all-dairy home to a meat-and-dairy home, mm -hmm. and she was Facebook posting about how many, like, accidents she's almost had trying to keep her forks and spoons and pots and pans and all yeah. that together. It just seems like way too much stress yeah. to have to deal with. Yeah, it does. Plus, you know, I was looking at what the cost is to, like, make meat dishes at home. And if you mm -hmm. compare them to restaurants, I mean, yeah, you kind of pay a convenience fee mm -hmm. <laughs> to be able to eat in a restaurant. Because right. if it costs you, like, 10 bucks for a steak, you're going to pay 25 for it in, you know, a kosher restaurant with tip and all of that. But at the same time, it's like, you know, how often are you really going to eat steak? Mm -hmm. And, you know... Do you really want to have to deal with separate everything? And just, I don't know, it's never appealed to me to yeah. have to go to that level of stress. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, not for you either? Well, I can't even eat meat anymore. So. That's true. Yeah. When you're a vegetarian for a long time, you end up losing the ability to eat, process meat in your body. Yeah. Yeah, I just don't feel well anymore when I've tried a couple of times. And just hadn't worked out for yeah. you. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, okay, what other kinds of questions do we have? Keep them, keep them coming, guys. And Tamara still hasn't asked her answer or asked her question about uh, S's. I don't remember what the other S's could possibly be. 
uh, Well Widget says, um, more than you probably need to know about me. <laughs> well, you already know some things about me, so there you go. The command to honor one's parents, does that apply to biological or adopted or both? If both or just biological, what if the biological parents have caused disabilities through alcohol or drugs and you have a hard time not hating them? Whew, that's rough. I'm sorry to, first of all, I'm sorry to hear that mm -hmm. you have that problem. That really sucks. Um, you want me to take this one or you want to take this one? Um, you want me to start and then... You, you start and okay. I'll interrupt. Okay, <laughs> so I, I mean, I guess I would point out the, that the mitzvah is to honor. And, and that's all there is to it. So the mitzvah isn't to like... It's not, you know... It's not be, even to love. It's not to love. It's not to like. It's not to be nice to. It's just to honor. So you have to think about what, you know, and like here, here, I mean, I'm not a lawyer, but apparently at some point I play one. Um, you know, so what's the different definition of honor? You know, so I guess you have to establish that first. Um, in terms of biological or adopted, I honestly don't know. Do you know? So... I don't remember the exact word that is used in the Ten Commandments for honor. So it's usually mistranslated as obey, but it's actually honor. And I'm going to assume it comes from the root word kavod, if I had to guess. Now, the thing about Hebrew is you can have a lot of synonyms, and those synonyms can have different kinds of meanings. So not knowing right off the top of my head what the word is that's used, I couldn't give you the super scary halakhic answer. Um, but generally speaking, honor had to do with hospitality. So if you look at the Sodom and Gomorrah story, if you look at uh, Abraham's tent, uh, Sarah's tent, um, if you look at any interaction that happens between any of the biblical characters and royalty, um, there's this idea of honoring, and it had to do with um, actually serving food, um, giving people rest, things like that. That that was how you honored people. It was um, being sort of very neighborly towards them. Just to interject for a minute, and then give it back to you. I was actually, um, interestingly enough, I was reading an article about this on um, Chabad's website um, a while ago now, and they had a really interesting take on it, and essentially it was a woman that had wrote in, like, to ask the rabbi or whatever, and they had asked, like, you know, what do I do? Like, I feel like my um, parent is emotionally abusing me. Right. You know? how do I gel that with the command to honor them? Right. And what Chabad said is you can't allow someone to abuse you. Right. And so to fulfill the mitzvah of honoring your parent, you avoid your parent. Right. So that you don't disrespect them or dishonor them. Right. Um, you you avoid a situation. There's also an idea that, that really speaks to that, and I think you really nailed it with that, that you don't, there's a, a mitzvah that you don't put a stumbling block before the blind. And we think of that as, you know, you don't, um, you don't trip, it, it sounds literal, like you don't trip someone up, you don't cause harm to someone. Um, but on a mental level, you think of what it means to put a stumbling block before the blind. Um, another way of looking at that is you don't pose a question to someone or you don't challenge someone in a way that they can't handle because they're blind in some aspect. So um, as an example, you would never say to a child with dyslexia, why are you not good at reading? You know, like you'd never do that. Yeah. You would because they're blind in a certain way, and you would never, you would never say, like I, I get into arguments with people about this all the time. You would never say to a dyslexic kid, if you want to have a bar mitzvah, you have to be able to read your Torah portion. Mm -hmm. That would be inappropriate. If you can't read, you can't read, and you don't put that stumbling block before someone. You don't intentionally challenge someone in a way that's not good for them and not good for you. So, you know, I would say in your case, you know, if the biolog if your bi biological parents have caused you um, problems and they're going to continue to and the alcohol and drugs is the issue, um, then they're blind. And the appropriate thing for you to do is to honor the fact that had it not been for them, you would not be alive. 
and you appreciate that. But, you know, the best thing to do, actually what Mary is saying here is, you know, you stay out of the way. Mm -hmm. And it's just like what you said. You just stay out of the way. Um, They can't help themselves. Um, Hopefully they will. You can pray for them. You can hope that they will. Um, If they reach out to you and say they want help, um, then that is where you should certainly jump in and say, okay, um, let's do this. And let's do it in a way that is correct and healthy. Um, but don't put a stumbling block before the blind. Don't, don't expect them to be something that you want them to be that they can't be, right now at least. Yeah. So that's how I feel about that. All right, keep them going. We got another uh, 15 minutes here. Um, so Tamara asks the question, uh, another t- tough topic, the S s- stood for suicide, not for sandwiches. Okay. Ooh, so, yeah. The, yeah, definitely sandwiches are more fun, but, mm-hmm. um, this is a way more important question. Yeah. So thank you, Tamara, for asking an important question. I think that's kind of what I was hoping to get out of this, that we could talk about some kind of deep stuff. Yeah. So, um, you know, so what is the Jewish view of suicide? Well, The Jewish view of suicide is a very humanistic one, which is you don't want to see people kill themselves. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, if you believe that God created everything, you don't want to destroy what God created, Mm -hmm. and that includes you. Um, Something that I like to say, but never works when I say it to people, is if someone treated me, so like the example of someone who's very depressed and wants to Uh, commit suicide. I would say to them, um, if someone treated me the way that you treat yourself, would you stand for that? And a friend, a true friend, would say, no, I would never let someone treat you the way that I treat myself. And so that's when you can then say, well, then why do you treat yourself like that? If someone treated you the way that you treat yourself, I'd go beat them up. You know, I, you know, I, I've never talked to them ever. Right. Um, because that's what friends do. So I try to say that to people that, you know, one of the great things that, that God did, and I actually learned this from an Orthodox rabbi. One of the great things that God did was make human beings in the image of God, meaning that we are self-conscious, which God is the only other entity in the universe that is self-conscious, according to Judaism. And what does that mean? Um, Ants and pigs and primates are all conscious. They're all aware. You know, we know they're aware. The cat, our cat, is aware of her surroundings. We know that. When she's awake. When she's awake, which is very often. Okay, right? Um... But she's not self-aware. She can't contemplate her awakeness and what her awakeness means for her. Um, Human beings can do that. Carl Sagan, one of my favorite quotes, and this is from an atheist, you know, said that we are the stuff of stars contemplating the stars. You know, what everything in the universe is made of is the same basic, basic ingredients. You know, it's carbon, oxygen, hydrogen, all these other things. So the stuff that made the Big Bang made you. So another thing I'd say to someone who is suicidal is, uh, you know, why are you trying to dim the light out? You know, Um, why are you trying to destroy God's creation? Um, What right is that of you? I'm not saying you, obviously, but I would say that to a person. Um, You know, the real question that I think people are asking when they ask a question like that is, you know, am I going to burn in hell, right? Like, that's really, it's it's afterlife questions. Mm -hmm. Um, So, you know, the simple answer is no. Not in Judaism. Judaism does not have a formal system for understanding the afterlife. You know, Jews, the one concrete belief is that one day there will be a bodily resurrection of all people. The righteous will continue to live, and everyone else will be blotted, meaning that your soul would literally be destroyed. You would just enter nothingness. Mm -hmm. Um, So if you want to take a very dogmatic view, that would be the dogmatic view. Um, 
you know, everything in the universe revolves around potential. So I have to think if you are a person who chooses destruction, which is what suicide is, it's choosing destruction in the same way that abusing yourself is choosing destruction in the same way that um, abusing other people is choosing destruction, um, then you are choosing to run counter to the way that God runs the universe. And is that what um, is that what Jews want to be? And so the answer to that is no. You got a better answer? Because <laughs> I, I don't you know. have I don't have a better answer. I just I think it's a really complicated topic because right. I think that you know if that's something you're choosing. You may also have other issues that means that it's not completely a self-conscious choice right. you're making. Right. Um, and so, exactly, Mary Ruth is saying it right now. How do we account for mel- mental illness ne- there now? And I, and I think that's the issue, is right. that, you know, m- many times when suicide, right. you know, happens, mental illness is involved. Right. And so, and so I think, you know, there's, there's no clear-cut answer to that, you right. know. Um, and I think that's where we have to, as as educated Jews, come in and say, what do I believe about God? Right. You know, do I believe in a compassionate God? You know, right. if I do, what does that mean? Right. You know, and, and I think, and that's, that's the answer so many times with Judaism is, you know, there's not a clear-cut answer. So what do you, given everything you know, believe? Right. Well, and what does it say? So let's let's think about this idea of what suicide does. So suicide removes you from the world. What does it say that our traditional theology is that heaven is this world? Mm-hmm. You know? So if the, if the question is, if you start from the premise of, I want to go to heaven, whatever that is, and Jewish theology says, well, the world that we live in is heaven. It's just not heaven yet. We're working on making it heaven then removing yourself from heaven would be sort of like putting yourself in hell, you know? Because if you believe that one day this world is going to be heaven and it's going to be a perfect world, then taking yourself out of the picture doesn't help to make it heaven. Um, mm-hmm. And it, it puts, you, it puts you or whomever would be the person having that problem uh, in that place of choosing, for lack of a better word, hell. Um, now, is it really a choice if you're mentally ill? You know, that's a whole other question. Um, but as part of the, the, the Jewish way of viewing the world, the word for peace, shalom, doesn't just mean peace like, yeah, hippie, woo, that stuff, or people not fighting anymore. Shalom actually means completeness. It means wholeness. So to give wholeness to others is part of uh, perfecting the world so that every piece of the world is heaven. So I would say for someone who is maybe feeling depressed, if you're dealing, let's say, with someone who's in that place, you know, I would say, you know, yeah, life really sucks. Um, Let's work together to make it better Mm because that's what we're supposed to do. Um, And don't uh, remove yourself from that experience because there's a lot of fun stuff left to be done. People, I think, mm-hmm. when they're at their worst depression, it's because they don't feel like there's a good end, And right? I, I mean, I think the other thing, too, is if you're in a position where you're, you know, you have a loved one or a friend that is in that place of being very depressed and starting to contemplate suicide, that, you know, for you, it's tikkun olam to help that person and to get them some professional help because the world can't be whole without them. Right. So Exactly. That's the, that is the way to word, word it. The world can't be whole without you. Peace can't, true world peace can't happen without you. So don't remove yourself because then you're doing the whole world a disservice. Mm-hmm. So let's answer a question about mezuzahs. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Tamara, for, for asking that question. So, Gesto says, hey, hey, Gesto, uh, I'm living with two non-Jews. Gasp. Each of us has his own room. I want to have mezuzah, but I'm not sure if I should have it on 
flat store or on my rooms? What do you think holocically, of course? Um, so, uh, I would say your room. Um, and the reason why I would say that is that probably the correct answer is the front door and all the doors that you go through. All of so it's it, it with mezuzahs it's any room that you eat in is basically like you know the the standard rule. Now it's way more involved than that, but that's kind of like the quick and dirty. If you eat there, it probably needs a mezuzah. Um, having said that, um, your room is probably more appropriate. Um, and in terms of sort of keeping the peace, so there's a lot of halacha that revolves around shalom bayit, which is normally looked at as um, husband and wife type relationships. Um, I would extend that to your uh, flatmates, and I would say if they are not Jewish and they would be weirded out by it, uh, probably best to keep that one in your own place. And, mm -hmm. and to remember that um, you know, in the Via Havta, which is where you find the um, where you find the commandment of mezuzot, it also says that you should lay tefillin. So if you can't go mezuzah crazy all over the place, you can lay tefillin every day, and that's the same concept. You know, it's it's binding Torah to your home and to yourself. So I would say, don't worry about the. Uh, mezuzahs uh, and worry more about uh, tefillin and Torah study because that is probably infinitely um, more halakhically appropriate. Yep. Yeah? Yep. I agree. <laughs> okay. Good. Yeah. Awesome. Glad to hear it. Okay. We have time for one or two more questions. Uh, so Well Widget's got one. We could probably fit a couple more in. Uh, I've been attending synagogue for a year now, but the rabbi hasn't brought up Beit Din or Mikvah. But when is hanging mezuzahs okay? Um, I would revert I, back to the original first question. Yeah, that you I would answered. say whenever you want. Like, you know, you're, you're not... Because you don't see yourself as a Jew, um, you're not bound by halacha. You're not bound to perform the mitzvah. However, if you want to, it's fine. Right. Um... Yeah. So. Maybe you hang them all up except for the one that goes on the front door. Mm -hmm. And then when you finish your conversion, you put the one on the front door. Or maybe you have one right now, and then when you convert, you buy yourself a brand new shiny one. And put up a new one. Yeah. It's all you, dude. Um, so, yeah. Absolutely. Here's what I would, uh, would rather do, though. Um, focusing on, like, um, some of these things about the saying Kaddish like you asked about in the mezuzah, here's what I would really do. I'd tug on your rabbi's jacket a little bit and be like, hey, it's time. We need yeah, to do this. And, and I mean, just based on the way you've worded the question, um, yeah, you you probably need to say like, hey, I, I'd like to convert sometime in the next decade. Well, we're like, still young, you, rabbi. You know, let's do like, this. <laughs> like, let's get on it. And like, don't be afraid to like, just keep calling them. You know, rabbis or her. or her, um, you know, in my experience, you know, sometimes it is that whole traditional they have to ask three times thing. Sometimes it's just that they're really busy and forget everything. Yeah. Okay. And that's, that's actually, I found to be more often the case. Let's dispel that myth right now, by the way. So a lot of people think that rabbis are jerks. And here's the way this really works. Rabbis have no time management skills whatsoever. Rabbis are slammed constantly. They are bad at checking email, generally speaking. Um, and the more traditional a rabbi is, I've found, um, the more time-consuming um, random things are in their job. So you think about like, so we've talked about, so we have a friend who's a conservative rabbi mm -hmm. and we talk behind his back all the time about him. And Dad, so, I hope he's not here. <laughs> like. And, and um, cause he's a great guy and he would totally get into it. But we actually thought about this one day. We were like, what's a day in the life of our conservative rabbi friend? 
Like, what it, what is his yeah. day? I want to follow him around one day. Totally. Actually. I'd love to do so. that. So, like, okay. So, he has to do uh, morning prayer services. He works six days a week, which is pretty common for rabbis. Most rabbis work six days a week. They either get Sunday or Thursday off. Um, and literally, he has to be at the shul about 7.15 for morning services. Um, and then he has to be back there by 7 o'clock, 6.30 sometimes for uh, Minchan Mariv. So he already has a 13-hour day ahead of him. You know, someone dies, uh, God forbid. Someone's born. <laughs> uh, someone needs to get married. Mm -hmm. Someone needs counseling. I had a situation um, a few months ago where I went to a my Hebrew tutor's house and she got a phone call from one of the rabbis that she works with who said that uh, he wasn't going to be able to make it to some event or something like that because a congregant was threatening to kill himself. Mm -hmm. I mean, this happens to rabbis. And the problem is you end up dropping the ball on people. Yeah. And I mean, you know, this is the thing is it happens, you know, with our conservative rabbi friend. He's a rabbi at a large temple here. Right. Um, and, you know, they have... Big one, suburban. Yeah, they have lots of professional help, and yet it's still an issue, you know. And then, on the other hand, a rabbi I knew in a smaller town, you know, it was the same story, and he had no professional help. You right. Know? He was, the like, literally the only the employee. The only employee. You know, and so it was another situation where it was like, you know, he was probably working 15-hour days. So, yeah. you know, he didn't remember whatever you asked him about five different times. Right. You know, so you just kind of have to keep hitting away at it. And it sucks because, you know, it's important to you and you feel weird about it or whatever. Yeah. You know, and you feel is. like they're judging you because they're mm -hmm. not. It's like the, it's, it's, it, life always goes back to being the kid in the cafeteria who mm -hmm. doesn't have a place to sit. Yeah. Like that's how, you know, even in adulthood, that's how we view, yeah. you know, the world. And you don't want to be bugging them, but you're like, God, I really would like to get this done. You know, whatever it is, conversion or, you know, like study or whatever. Right. You know? Right. Um, you're like, I'd really like to get it done. I don't want to bother. You're not bothering them. You right. know, just keep plugging away until it happens. Right. And so Mary makes the comment that she met with a rabbi on a regular basis, and that that's how uh, the rabbi was able to decide, you know, what, what time it was. Um, and so I would say if you're dealing with a stubborn rabbi, a rabbi who's just kind of like not completely together um, and uh, sort of can't can't get to you and isn't making you a priority, um, here's what I would do, and this works. Because this is how it works with me, even though I'm not a rabbi. Um, you show up and you say, um, how can I volunteer for the community? What do you need done right now? And if the rabbi says, well, we really need someone to like put stamps on all these letters, guess what? Sit down, put the stamps on the letter, get the rabbi a cup of coffee, go wash the, the, the rabbi's car, like whatever it is. Because honestly, the more you can put yourself either in the community volunteering mm -hmm. or doing stuff with the rabbi and being in the rabbi's face all the time, the more natural it is for the rabbi to think about you. Right. We have this unfair thing in particularly progressive Judaism where we think, oh, well, I take a class and one day they decide they like me. And that's when right. I get to become a Jew. And that's not what it is. And, and I mean, I think that the other thing, too, is, you know, rabbis, depending on your rabbi and what their philosophy is, you know, rabbis take a very different, from rabbi to rabbi, their philosophy on conversion can be very different. And so you may have a rabbi that's like, oh, you take the class, and after you take the class, we'll talk, and then we'll schedule the, um, the bait din and the mikvah. You know, on the other hand, you may have a rabbi that feels like community is the most important part of becoming a Jew, and until they feel that you're sufficiently part of the community, they're not going to volunteer setting up the Beit Din and the Mikvah. Right. You know, and so, you know, it's worth figuring out what the situation is, you know. Right. So. 
Absolutely. And that's a whole like three hour long conversation we that can is, probably yes. have. That is. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do the mo- the important thing that I have to do, which is to thank all of you for coming and to let you know that we are a, an online community that is funded entirely by donations. We are a 501c3 nonprofit, which means that all donations are tax deductible. Listen, it costs $210 a month to do just one shawl, right? So I'm not even talking about my time. I'm not talking about Punctura. I'm not talking about YouTube videos. I'm not talking about answering emails. I'm not talking about uh, the online chat system that we have now on Punctura and One Shoal. I'm not talking about speaking engagements. I'm not talking about podcasts. I'm only talking about the box that you're looking at right now. That costs $210. If every person would give $5, that would pay for that chat system. So how do you do that? So you go on the top of the One Show website where it says Donate, and you just click. I've included it in the chat room. Now, another thing that's really cool, and we just started this today, and I didn't promote it um, at the 3 o'clock class but I'm going to promote it tonight. We have something on the Punctora website now called What Punctora Needs. And what it does is it explains out how much things cost. What is a week of payroll? People think that if you're a nonprofit and you are a... um, uh, you are somehow like not having to pay taxes. And that's not true. We do. We pay payroll taxes. So how much are our payroll taxes? How much do the chat rooms cost? How much um, does a YouTube video cost to make? That's all there on the Punctura website. And what's great about this is that you can choose what you want to fund. So if you are all about YouTube videos, but you're not really into one show, you just fund the YouTube videos. If you love one show, maybe you're not really that interested in Punctura, money can go directly to one show. So that's what that allows you to do. So you can give a general donation and that goes into the general pile that helps us pay for everything or if you want to help fund something specific you can click on that uh, what Punctora needs link or you can go on punctora.org and check that out. So appreciate everyone that's been here again please support Punctora, support One Shoal. We can't do it without your donations. We have all kinds of great events coming up This week, make sure to check out the calendar. I'll go ahead and post that here uh, in the chat room. We've got, let's see what all we've got going up. So tomorrow, we've got Rosh Chodesh at 7 o'clock with Ketsira, which is fantastic. This uh, weekend, this Friday, 6 p.m., so a little earlier than normal, we'll have an early Kabbalat Shabbat service. Uh, I'll be hosting that. And if you live in the Atlanta area, this Saturday, Stephanie is going to be teaching Jewish yoga. Yep. It's so, going to be a lot of fun. I hear that everyone that comes gets is sore the next day. Oh, well, that's... So that's great. You that's, know? that's exactly what you want out of a Jewish community. You want soreness. <laughs> well, we all are looking for different things, Patrick. It's true. <laughs> So the event calendar I've posted there in the chat room. Again, please support the community. Please give a donation. Please get involved. If you have any questions, comments, concerns, you can always email me, patrick at punctora.org. Thank you very much. Thank you, Stephanie, for being here. Of course. And uh, I look forward to seeing everyone tomorrow and Friday. Take care.